I was really talking about Timothy back there right now. <laughs> Love that guy. <clears throat> Put your finger in Luke 9 and also go to 2 Peter chapter 1. Luke 9 and 2 Peter chapter 1. Well, I really don't know what I'm going to say today, but let's have fun, okay? <laughs> Luke nine twenty eight. It says, some eight days after these sayings, Jesus took along Peter and John and James and went up on the mountain to pray. And while he was praying, the appearance of his face became different, and his clothing became white and gleaming. And behold, two men were talking with him, and they were Moses and Elijah, who, appearing in glory, were speaking of his departure, which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. Now Peter and his companions had been overcome with sleep. But when they were partially awake, sorry, but when they were fully awake, they saw his glory. Can you imagine? They saw his glory and Moses and Elijah standing with him. And as these were leaving him, and I don't know if they just faded away, if they just walked away and disappeared, or they went up in a cloud, it doesn't say. By the way, if you die in Jesus Christ and you belong to him, been born again, you don't die. Jesus is not the God of the dead. He's the God of the living. And as these were leaving him, Peter said to Jesus, Master, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three tabernacles. One for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah, not realizing what he was saying. And while he was saying this, a cloud formed, and it began to overshadow them. This wasn't no little cloud, and this wasn't no white cloud. This was a dark cloud. And it began to overshadow them, and they were afraid as they entered the cloud. Then a voice came out of the cloud saying, This is my son, my chosen one. Listen. Listen. To him. And when the voice had spoken, Jesus was found alone, and they kept silent and reported to no one in those days any of the things which they had seen. And if you read Mark's account, the reason they did that is because Jesus told them not to say anything until after his resurrection. Second Peter chapter 1. Verse 16. Peter's writing here, and he's referring to this account we just read. Verse 16 says, well, verse, look at verse 12. Y'all see verse 12? Therefore, I will always be ready to remind you of these things, even though you already know them. And have been established in the truth which is present for you. And I consider it right as long as I am in this earthly dwelling to stir you up by way of reminder. You know, that's one of my jobs. I get to come here on Sunday and I get to stir you up. By way of reminder. Even if it's a truth you've heard for 50 years. We get to stir your spirit up. Stir the fire up in your soul. Hallelujah. And it's fun. (laughs) 
Jesus said, I consider it right as long as I am in this earthly dwelling to stir you up by way of reminder. And then Peter, referring to himself, knowing that the laying aside of my earthly dwelling is imminent, as also our Lord Jesus Christ has made clear to me, and I will also be diligent that at any time after my departure you will be able to call these things to mind. You know what will be one of the joy of my hearts? If the day ever comes and the Lord calls me away from this church to do something else, that someday in the future you come up to me and say, you know what, I remember this thing you taught me, I remember this thing you preached, and it impacted my life, and it would just bless my heart. I haven't had a lot of sleep, so I'm going to cry today. You just know that, okay? Verse 16, for we did not follow, we did not follow cleverly devised tales, myths. When we made known to you the power and the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Don't you get tired of these people that just said this is just a book of fairy tales? That's why I said to you, emphasized to you back in Luke 9, that they just weren't partially awake or just slightly waking up out of their sleep when they beheld their glory. Luke writes and makes sure we understand that they were fully awake when they beheld what they beheld. And he says, we did not follow cleverly devised tales when we made known to you the power and the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. But we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. Do you know what they were beholding there that day? They were beholding not the Lord who had come the first time as a babe and in flesh, clothed in flesh, but they were beholding the Lord of glory who was going to come again in power and great majesty. That's what they were watching. That's what they were looking at. And he says here, but we were eyewitnesses. You need to underline that, eyewitnesses of his majesty. Majesty. Can I tell you something? It just wasn't one person that saw this thing transpire, and it wasn't just two people that saw this thing transpire. It was three people that saw this thing transpire. We are talking here about historical fact. That's a good place to say amen right there. We were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For when he, Jesus, received honor and glory from God the Father... Such an utterance as this was made to him by the majestic glory. And what did the, what did the Father say? The majestic glory say, This is my beloved Son with whom I am well pleased. And there's a dash there and the thought goes on. And he says this, And we ourselves heard this utterance made from heaven when we were with him on the holy mountain. So it wasn't just something that they had seen. It was something that they had heard. I want to know, is there anybody here today that's ever seen anything of God or, or heard anything from God? Amen. Praise the Lord. I am grieving and tired over a Christianity that has no God, has a power of religion, but denies the power thereof. They go to church and there is no presence, no experience. They hear nothing from God. God wants a living relationship with us as people. Amen. By the way, He's alive. And we ourselves heard this utterance made from heaven when we were with him on the holy mountain. Verse 19 says, so we have, or I want to start with the word we, we have the prophetic word, take the word made out of there because it was just put in there and it shouldn't have been put in there in my opinion. We have the prophetic word more sure. And he says here, to which you do well, to pay attention. Can I tell you something? He heard something and he saw something, but there was something even greater than what they saw and heard. What could be greater than what they had seen and heard? What they saw and heard couldn't be any greater, but the, what I'm trying to point out here that they had the prophetic word of God already. 
Do you know that the Old Testament and all the scriptures that you're going to find there, that in the Bible itself, that in the Old Testament alone, there are 1,845 references to the second coming of Jesus Christ. 17 Old Testament books give prominence to the coming again of our Lord Jesus Christ. They testified of his coming in the first coming of his sufferings, and they also testify of the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's not just the New Testament. It's just not a a Christian thing. It was there from the very beginning. Shout hallelujah. I tell you, they saw something. They heard something. But... Even something that was more true than even their witness is the witness of the Word of God. How many of you believe this is the Word of God? And even in the New Testament, out of a total of 260 chapters that make up the New Testament, 318 references are to the second coming of Jesus Christ. 23 of the 27 books of the New Testament refer to the second coming of Jesus. Can let me announce to you today, Jesus Christ is on His way. And some things I'm going to teach on Wednesday night. He ain't far away. He ain't far away. Are you ready? Look, every single one of us here has a date with the Lord Jesus Christ. The King of glory. So what he's saying here in this, in this great letter. He says, we have the more sure prophetic word. Yeah, I want you to take my word about Jesus. I want you to take my word about his coming. I want you to take my word about what I've seen and heard. I want you to hear what God's told me or what I've seen. And I want to hear what God's told you. But we have something more sure than your pastor's word. You have this? Oh, my soul. To which you do well to pay attention. No, you wouldn't believe this. Yes, you would. Even the people that come here, and I know who's paying attention and who's not. I know whose heart's in it and who's not. I know who's really hearing and who's not. And if I know, you know God knows. To which you do well to pay attention as to a lamp shining in a dark place. And I've got to tell you, we are living in a dark place. But thank God for the light. And thy word is a lamp unto my feet. It is a light to my path. Hallelujah. We do well to pay attention as to a lamp shining in a dark place. How long are we going to pay attention? Until the day dawns. The day of the Lord. And the morning star arises. In your heart. And the great significance again about the morning star is that even when it shines in a particular season of the year and it shines in the early morning and the sun's still coming up, guess what? Even though the sun is coming up over the horizon, you can still see this star. Oh, my soul. But get this. Until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts, it is a heart matter. Verse 20, but know this. First of all, or above all, know this, that no prophecy of Scripture that speaks about either the first coming or the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, and there's more about the second coming than the first coming, and there's no prophecy of Scripture that is a matter or a concern that came out of somebody's own interpretation. Let me tell you something. Up there, this, this prophetic word is a lamp to our feet. This prophetic word will give you illumination. How many, how many of you walked into your house and you walked into our dark room? And I tell you, our den, if you go downstairs in my bedroom, there's no windows in our, in our room down there. And you go down there, it's dark, you're going to hurt yourself. What do you do? You turn the lamp on. It illumines the heart. I got to tell you, my mind and my heart need to be illumined by God. You can search and search and dig and dig and men study and men get information, but they are never able to come to the knowledge of the truth until the illumination from God comes into their heart. That's what we need. We've got illumination. But notice this, we have revelation, as one commentator said in verse 20. But know this, first of all, that no prophecy of Scripture is a matter of one's own interpretation. God has got to reveal some of these things to us. 
And He does. He's revealed it generally through creation. And He's revealed it specifically through this. And then He says here, because no prophecy was ever made by an act of human will. Oh, just a bunch of men that got around and they decided that these certain books would make up the Bible and, and it didn't happen until the Council of Nicaea. And I got to tell you, in the New Testament age itself, before the first century was over with, the church knew which books belonged in the Bible. Thank God it was confirmed by that council two or three centuries later. But they knew, they knew Ah, there's so many rigorous tests that is put through anyway for it to be part of the canon of Scripture. No prophecy was ever made by an act of human will, but men moved, borne along, carried by the Holy Spirit. It's, the, it's a reference, the Greek word is a reference to a ship on a sea, and it's got its big sails up, and what's blowing the ship? It is a wind that is moving and carrying the, the ship along. There were some men that God had appointed, and God touched and God called and he anointed them and he moved upon them and these men moved by the Holy Spirit. You know what they did? They spoke from God. I don't ever, and I know it's happened and it's not my desire, but to ever come to this pulpit and not be moved by the Spirit of God with a word from God for you that didn't come out of my heart but came from God through my heart. That's what's wrong with the pulpits of America today. We have people standing in the pulpits. They've never even been born again. They're trying to preach something they really don't even know about. It's just like Ken telling me about one of the priests in the church where he was at. He said, I knew more about the Bible than he did. And some places they go, they have a whole year worth of sermons for you to preach. Where is getting on your face before God and saying, God, give me a word from heaven for your people? But false prophets arose. False prophets also arose. And if you don't think we're living in the day where false prophets are not abounding... among the people of God, just as there will also be false teachers among you who will secretly, covertly introduce destructive heresies, even denying the master who bought them, bringing swift destruction upon themselves. And I'm telling you, some of you may not be aware of it, but some of these leaders that have risen up in the emergent church and some of these other movements, I've got to tell you, as they are destroying the teachings of Christianity. Verse 2. They bring swift destruction upon themselves. Many will follow their sensuality. And because of them, the way of the truth will be maligned, spoken against talked evil about. And in their greed, they will exploit you with false words and their judgment. Their judgment from long ago is not idle. Did, did you get that statement? Are you letting that sink in? Oh, God appointed them to judgment a long time ago. Let me tell you something. That judgment is not idle. It's ready. It's waiting to be brought forth. Their judgment from long ago is not idle, and their destruction is not asleep. Here it is. What's the proof of that? For if God did not spare angels in the ancient days when they sinned, and I think this is in the days of Noah, but they cast them into hell, but God cast them into hell and committed them to pits of darkness, they are reserved for judgment, and God's going to call them back out of hell, and He's going to judge those angels for eternity. And God, who did not spare the ancient world, but preserved Noah, a preacher of righteousness, with, with 7,000 others, with 1 million, with, uh, throw any number out there, how many people were saved with him? Seven. At least he was able to get his own family into the safety of the ark. At least his family. 
God did not spare the ancient world. Let me say it again. In the entire world, there are over 200 different cultures around the world that have a flood story. They found artifacts and the same type fossils all over the world that were destroyed in a moment of time. It's all over the world. God did not spare the ancient world, but he preserved Noah. He was a preacher of righteousness and with seven others when he brought a flood upon the world of the ungodly. By the way, how many of you know God is compassionate? We sang today about the God who is slow to anger. Anybody ever, did you all sing that? Did you all sing that? Slow to anger? Do you know that God waited 1,600 years before he brought this destruction upon the world? At any time, they could have heard the message. Any time they could have believed. Any time they could have turned. Any time they could have heard the message from Noah and said, yes, I'm coming, I'm coming, oh God, I believe. Let me throw this one out. You're familiar with the days when he told Abraham, you're going to get the land of the Canaanites, but it's going to be 400 years from now before that happens. 400, four generations and then God sent them in, and of course, they were exterminating those nations justly. You know what? God waited 400 more years for those people to get right with him. Let me declare to you today, God is a God who is slow to anger. Verse 6, and if he condemned the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah, and they know where these cities are, where they were located. If he condemned the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. By the way, so what was the big deal about Sodom and Gomorrah? Anybody know? Just tell me. What was the big, what was the big thing there? The big sin. What was it? Sexual sin, sexual perversion, and homosexuality was, was the big deal. But do you know something? There was a man named Abraham that pleaded with God and said, if, you'll, if there's just 50 people in the whole town, we you spare it? What did God say? Yeah. How about 40, God? If there's 40, yes, I'll spare it. 30. 20. God, if there'd just be 10 people, would you spare the city? How many of you know God's merciful? If he told Abraham, if there's 10 souls that are righteous in that town, I'll spare the city. They could not even find ten. And if he condemned the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah to destruction by reducing them to ashes, having made them an example to those who would live ungodly lives thereafter, and if he rescued righteous Lot, oppressed, by the sensual conduct of unprincipled men. Is anybody here, anybody here identify with, with Lot in this? I, I do. I, I can't tell you, there's sometimes you're just watching a commercial and you get oppressed by what you see. And you get oppressed by, by men who have no scruples, who are unprincipled men. <clears throat> I think the King James Version says vexed. Oppressed by sensual conduct of unprincipled men. Verse 8, for by what he saw and heard, that righteous man, while living among them, felt his righteous soul tormented, vexed day after day by their lawless deeds. And then, but here's a good word. Y'all ready for this? Then the Lord knows how to rescue the godly from temptation. I want to know if anybody here has a witness to that. God pulled you out of some temptations? There's never been a temptation, God, that, that has come my way that God has not always provided an open door or a way of escape. Every time! Blessed be his name. The Lord knows how to rescue the godly from temptation and to keep the unrighteous under punishment for the day of judgment. And especially those who indulge the flesh in its corrupt desires and despise authority. What kind of generation is that? By the way, he's talking about people in the, fam in the church house. This whole chapter, this whole book.
daring, self-willed. They do not tremble when they revile angelic majesties. Whereas, and there's another teaching there. Whereas angels who are greater in might and power do not bring a reviling judgment against them. Even angels don't do that. No wonder there's some people out here, I'll just go ahead and say it. There are some people with not correct understanding. I'm talking about Christians born again, love God, but they're out here defying territorial spirits. Are you kidding? Angels would not even speak, would not even rebuke them. Anybody here read the Bible? Talk to me. Whereas angels who are greater in might and power do not bring a reviling judgment against them before the Lord. But these kind of people, like unreasoning animals born as creatures of instinct to be captured and killed, these reviling where they have no knowledge will in the destruction of those creatures also be destroyed, suffering wrong as the wages of doing wrong. We need to stop there. Let's let's get on to chapter 3. Chapter 3. Verse 1 says, This is now, beloved, the second letter I'm writing to you. Everybody knows about 1 Peter, I'm assuming. This is the second letter I'm writing to you in which I am stirring up your sincere mind. I want to know if anybody here has got a mind here today. I want to know if anybody here has got a mind here and you use it. I'm just playing with you. I want to know if anybody here has got a sincere mind. Genuine. Or are you just playing the game? He said, I'm here, I'm writing to you in which I am stirring up your sincere mind by way of reminder that you should remember the words. Remember what words? The prophetic word. Remember the words spoken beforehand by the holy prophets and the commandment of the Lord and Savior, which was spoken by your apostles. About what? About the coming of the Lord. Verse 3, know this above all. First of all means above all that in the last days, mockers will come. And he's not talking about those that may be at some university that's on the far left of thinking or somebody else that's outside. He's talking about even those within the church. Mockers will come with their own mocking, following after their own lusts and saying, saying, where, where, where is this promise? Where is this promise? Where is the promise of his coming? Tell me. Forever since the fathers, they go on talking and palavering, and they say forever since the fathers fell asleep, talking about the fathers from ancient days, the patriarchal fathers way back when. Forever since then, all continues just as it was from the, from the beginning of creation. At least they acknowledge there's a creator. All continues just as it was from the beginning of creation. For when, and Peter now says, stop quoting them, and he says, for when they maintain this, it escapes their notice that by the, by the what? By the word of God. By the word of God, the heavens existed long ago. And the earth, by the word of God, was formed out of water and by water. How great is the word of God? Anybody know? How powerful is the word of God? How mighty is the word of God? The 33rd Psalm, verses 6 to 9, says that God spoke it, the Lord spoke it, He commanded it, and it was created. The Lord said, let there be what? Let there be light, and it was done. Let the land come forth from the water, and it was what? Done. You know what they scientists have found? Scientists have found that all this, all of the, uh, every plant and herb and everything that they find all over the, all over the world, they realize that if they go back and study it, this was some part on the Truth Project, it was a remarkable thing. They have found out that everything just didn't gradually appear. When they go back into the historical and archaeological record, you know what they find? It all appeared at one time. I've got articles right now that where scientists have gone back and they have found the point of beginning. Oh! It escapes their notice that by the word of God, the heavens 
existed long ago. God spoke the heavens into existence. And the earth was formed out of water and by water. On the third day, he commanded land to come forth out of the water, and it appeared. Verse 6, through which that same word, the world, at that time was destroyed. The world being cosmos is the Greek word, and it means inhabitants, all kind of inhabitants, through which the world at that time was destroyed, being flooded with water. Verse 7, but it also escapes their notice that but by his word, the present heavens and the present earth are being reserved for fire, kept for the day of judgment and destruction of, of ungodly men. But listen now today, folks, do not let this one fact escape your notice, beloved, that with the Lord one day is like a thousand years and a thousand years like one day. God doesn't count time the way we count time. Right? It's taken out of Psalm 90. Go back and look at it. The Lord, that with the Lord, one day is like a thousand years and a thousand years like one day. By the way, so since the, since the time of Christ and his crucifixion and his resurrection and his ascension back to glory, how many days has it been? Hmm. Well, how many, how many days has it been? How many? It's been two days. Two complete days. Well, how do you know? We've come through about 2,000 years since that time. About 2,000. But I know something that happens on the third day. Because on the third day, Jesus was raised to life again. And on the third day, he's going to resurrect Israel to life again. And you see it happening right in front of your eyes. And he's coming to rule and reign over this earth. Yay, I'm all excited about that. Forever. For a thousand years and then forever. Listen to this. And he says here, so the Lord, verse 9, what an awesome God. The Lord is not slack or he's not slow about his promise. Didn't we sing something about today about some promises too today? Didn't we do that? The promises of the Lord. The Lord's not slow about his promise. How many of you think we serve an awesome God? You know what? This word says, but he's patient. He's patient towards you. Not wishing for any to perish. And he means eternally. But he desires all to come to what? We were talking about it today in Sunday school in the ministry training hour. Proverbs 28, 13 talks about, we were talking about confession and prayer and how all these people come and they make confession or whatever. But Proverbs 28, 13 says, whosoever confesses and forsakes his sin shall find mercy. Whoever covers his sin is not going to prosper. But whosoever confesses and forsakes his sin shall find mercy. I love that. Repentance. Repentance. You know what? That's why salvation is really more than just a decision. It is a decision. It is a decision, but it's more than that. Well, what do you mean? Because you can make a decision with your mind, and you can turn, but let me tell you something. It's got to be from your heart. The innermost being of the man. God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. <clears throat> you know there's hope for the sermon to end today because there's only eight more verses left. <laughs> this word from the Lord. But the day of the Lord will come. Let me announce that again. The day of the Lord will come. What a day that will be when my Jesus I shall see and I look upon his face, the one who saved me by his grace. And when he takes me by the hand and leads me through this wonderful land, what a day, what a day that will be. I can hear old Sister Sperry right now shouting, yeah, we were free will Baptists, but we had we had people shout in our church. <laughs> Let me.
Let me announce to you today, the day of the Lord will come, and you don't have to take my word for it. Take a more sure word. The day of the Lord will come, and he's going to come like a thief. But he ain't coming like a thief to me. I'm a child of the day, not of the night. The night, the night's out there already. It's a dark place we're living in, but we're children of the day. I'm, I'm looking and aware and paying attention to the signs. The day of the Lord will come, but he's going to come like a thief. To those who are the outside, in which the heavens, the heavens will pass away with a roar. You ever heard, man, I, I got to tell you, one time I was a youth pastor many years ago, and I built this big old, big old pile of debris and stuff, and I was going to make a big bonfire for this big extravaganza we were having for teenagers, and I'm, how am I going to start this fire? Well, I got real smart, and I found me a whole gallon or a whole two gallons of gas, and I just, I was 23, 20, I was 24. And I stayed about this close to that fire, and I took my match, and I went, <laughs> except it was a, I singed my hair on my hands and my face and my eyebrows, and I fell backward, and Woo! I was trying to describe to you what a roaring flame sounds like. I've gained a few smarts since then. Uh, the heavens are going to pass away with a roar, and the elements, some of you that are real familiar with chemistry, the elements are going to be destroyed with intense heat. You know what I... I've been around fires lately and been grilling, of course, some every now and then. I grill every now and then. I grill about twice a year. <laughs> Seth's the griller. Uh, I don't really care anything about it. But um, you ever feel the heat coming off them things? And all God's got to do, that, these atomic weapons and and all they change, they, they just change the atomic chemistry of it. And poof! And everything just burns up everywhere. By the way, the earth is never going to go away. He is just going to recreate the thing. He's going to put new skin on the whole thing. The Bible says it's going to be destroyed with intense heat. And the earth and its works are going to be laid bare. They're going to be revealed. They're going to be burned up. And that means they're going to be laid bare. By the way, nothing of man is going to survive. Listen to me. Nothing of man, nothing of natural works, nothing of the flesh, nothing is going to survive. Thank God for something more than the natural. We got the spiritual and the supernatural. Praise God. Now, I personally don't believe this part of the day of the Lord is going to happen until the end of the thousand years. But there's, read Revelation, you want to find out what's going to happen at the beginning. Anybody here ever read Revelation? But I will tell you this, verse 11. Since all these things are to be destroyed in this way, what sort of people ought we to be? Now there's your question. There's your question. You see, last couple of weeks, especially two weeks ago, talking and preaching on the wrath of God, Believe me, that's not an easy subject to talk about. But I don't want you perishing. I don't want you going to hell over me. I want you to live forever. So let's throw the warning out there. Throw the warning. The righteous, holy, and just God. Yes, he's loving, caring, merciful, long-suffering, patient. Thank God. But two weeks ago, and then last week's message as a follow-up, I got to tell you, because of this thing that's coming, the day of the Lord is coming, you know what we do? Look at me. You know what we do? We persuade men. If you ever had, get the anointing of God on your life and ask God to give you some people to share the good truth with and be as persuasive as you can be. We persuade men. But 
<laughs> we not only do, do that, verse 11, we are motivated. We are motivated. Anybody here saved and a believer? Anybody here? Yeah. Anybody? Y'all say? We are motivated not only to persuade men, but we are motivated to purify our lives. You can't play with sin. You're going to get burned. You can't tilly diddly daddle with it. You can't just, you can't live on the edges. You're going to get burned. That's what we were talking about, too, in the earlier hour. There's some people that's going to run you and say, oh, I'll go ahead and do that thing anyway because God will forgive me. Well, there's a real heart of repentance. What sort of people ought we to be? Y'all answer the question in the last phrase. Ready? Everybody out loud. Ready? In holy conduct and godliness. In holy conduct. That just means your conduct now is a lot different than it used to be when you're out there with those other folks. And we love them other folks. We don't want them to go to hell. We don't want them to perish. We don't want them. We want them to have the truth. But you no longer hang out with them. Why? Because you're holy. That just means you've been separated and set apart. You no longer do what they do. And they no longer do what you do. And they don't want to hang around you anymore. No, they don't. I don't know. Because you don't keep. But I love them. I pray for them. Absolutely. Yes, you love them. You pray for them. You want to see them. Find what you found. And they no longer wipe your wallet clean. Praise the Lord right here. Come on. <laughs> because, let's look at me, it's holy conduct. Holy just means separated. We're different. Thank God. Anybody, again, have you been tormented and vexed and oppressed by what you see and hear out there? It's just, oh, it's at an all-time high. And let me tell you, not just, not just men, but women, and not just men and women, but children, they can throw some words on you that you just, I'm talking about elementary school kids, and they'll throw the most vile stuff on you that you're just dropping your jaw. Since all these things are, are to be destroyed in this way, what sort of people ought you, we to be in a holy conduct and godliness, being godlike? You know what? People, are, people that are like that, what are they doing? They're looking for and hastening the day of God. How many of you, how many of you are looking for the day of God? There ain't very many Christians looking for it. I'm just telling you right now. Looking for and hastening you hasten it by this holy conduct and godly life and praying and intercession and telling others about Jesus. That's what you're doing. You're hastening, looking for it, hastening the day of God. Man, I'm ready for the day of God. I'm done with the day of the devil. The adversary, the trickster, the, de the de demonic powers, the deception, and the lies, and the father of lies, and all the evil that's being spewed forth across the world. Are you tired of it yet? Are you tired of it yet? Let's have the day of God. Oh, what a blessed day. Because of which in that day the heavens will be destroyed by burning. And a reminder there, the elements will melt with intense heat. So verse 13, but according to his promise, you know, has he promised? Did he promise to come back again? Don't let your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. For in my Father's house are many rooms, and I'm going to prepare a place for you. You know what? And I will come again, and I'm going to receive you unto myself. That where I am, you can be also. May God give this church a fresh vision of the majestic glory and of the glory of Jesus Christ. May we see him in his transfigured coming glory. Even before he gets here. But according to his promise, we are looking for new heavens. And we're looking for a renewed, a new earth, new in quality. In which, guess, get, get a little of this, in which righteousness dwells. Whew. So therefore, beloved, since you look for these things, be diligent. Everyone say those two words, be diligent. Ready? Be diligent to be found by him 
in peace in your heart and among us in peace and be spotless and be blameless. Remember, these, these, these dudes over in chapter 2, these guys were stains and blemishes, but he wants us to be spotless and blameless. And regard the patience of our Lord as, what's the word? As salvation. What a patient God. What a patient God. Oh, you've been so great today. I want you to stand to your feet if you're able to stand right now. Don't want anybody going anywhere, if possible. your heads please before the Lord ask him to just reveal himself to you if he hasn't already are you ready for his coming if you died in the position that your life is in right now the status your life is in right now Would he welcome you into his arms? He's such a loving, patient, kind, long-suffering God. And he's made the way for us to have eternal life. Are you right with him? Right now, right where you're standing or right where you're sitting right now, You need to do business with God. Ask him to come into your heart. Ask him to change your life. Ask him to transform you. Some of you have got some things in your lives, brothers and sisters, you need to lay down. You need to take them to the cross and leave them there. Right now, all over this room, all over this room, do business with the Lord right now. Saints are praying. Humble yourself in the sight of the Lord and just say, Lord God, I know I'm just like everybody else, a sinner. Church won't get me there. Even living right won't get me there to be with you. Lord, my life, I just acknowledge my own sins before you and I ask you to, I'm receiving you as my Savior. I'm receiving you into my life and my heart before it's too late. Just tell him, just pray that right now, right where you're sitting, right where you're standing. Right there, right there. Dear brother and sister in Christ, right now. Just tell him right now, tell him right now. You want to live spotless and blameless? You want to be found in peace with your brothers and sisters? You want to be ready for the day of the Lord that is coming? And ask him right now to show him your glory. Show me your glory in the days to come. Let me see your glory, Lord. Father God, as we stand or sit here in your presence, because you're here today, God, I pray right now that as you hear the prayers of these people, and you know who's praying what, and you know what you know what sincere mind is being engaged here. God receive them. God change them. God rescue them. God transform us. Get us ready for your coming. The words going out. The coming of the Lord, Jesus is coming. Jesus Christ is coming. Jesus Christ is coming. All across this building, all across this building. If you prayed some kind of prayer like that today, if you have